Good morning, all of you. I welcome you all to Ansarkari and I hope that you all must be doing great. So in this video, we'll be analyzing three important newspapers. So the first one is going to be The Hindu. So let's start with it. So there was a 86 person voter turnout in Tripura assembly elections and there were a few incidences of violence also. So there were reports of threats, intimidation and assault. They emerged from Santir Bazaar and all these areas which are there in Tripura and counting of votes is going to take place on 2nd of March. Mm -hmm. Apart from that, crackdown on SMS spammers and the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, it directs the telecom firms to like crack down on the SMS spammers. Basically, they've asked the... Um, Telecom Regulatory Authority of India is the regulator of this sector and it has asked the telecom operators to crack down on the spanners who are spilling past protections uh, introduced in the recent years. And authority said that it had issued two orders under the Telecom Commercial Communication Customer Preference Regulations of 2018 and the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India Act 1997. So this, uh, the regulator is a statutory body and so the, or, they ordered the telecom operators to disallow the commercial calls and the text from being placed using the regular mobile numbers also. So you can see in the picture that President Color is being awarded to the Haryana Police by the Union Home Minister and this is a flag which is awarded. So that is there and Haryana becomes the 10th state in the country to be bestowed with this exceptional honour. So the chief minister of Punjab said that the Telangana irrigation system is role model for the nation. And so we should obviously learn from how the irrigation system works in the state. So they have basically the Kaleshwaram lift irrigation project. And he has been visiting there to you know, gain the knowledge sharing about how the entire system works there. So you can see the Ram temple in the works and how the artisans, they are carving on the stone slab. So navigating the foreign trade dynamics that needs sharper policy responses because obviously we are right now we are witnessing a slowdown in the global demand. So that is impacting our export sector. And yesterday we also understood that even our imports have declined because the domestic demand is also declining. So India's goods exports, which is a key driver of its growth impulses and a major job creator also, it got off to a disappointing start in 2023. Yesterday we saw that in January. The trade has been declining, specifically the merchandise export that is declining. And apart from that, along with an anticipated post Christmas cooling off in demand, we see that order books probably they took a hit as much from the actual slowing of the economic activity as buyers, they are very, buyers very assessments about the consumer confidence level. So obviously, uh, when it comes to the inflation expectations, they are also high. So given all these things, we are seeing a fall in both the domestic and the foreign demands. 
And even the engineering exports, they have fell 10%. The pharma products, they lost the momentum. Apart from that, including the jewelry and the textile sector, that is also like seeing a slowdown in the demand. So the silver lining is that imports dipped too. So bringing the goods trade deficit to a 12 month low. So obviously we are having a trade deficit, but since the imports also declined, so the trade deficit declined. And so if this trend holds, we'll be seeing India's current account deficit for 2022-23 may end up lower than the uncomfortable 3% plus levels of the GDP projected by most agencies. And so as I told you that uh, the drop in imports, it suggests that the domestic demand growth is also fading. And only a part of this step down can be ascribed to the lower commodity prices as a non-oil and the non-gold imports, they have fallen by a sharper 6.7% from the January 2022 levels. So our Commerce Ministry has argued that India's weaker trade balance this fiscal year has been driven by two-way effect of a slowing world economy hurting the exports and the resilient domestic demand showing up the imports. So obviously because of that, we saw that we have been talking about that Indian economy is resilient. So since we were having higher demand, so we were importing more and at the same time, our exports were falling. So because of this two-way effect, we saw that we had a weaker trade balance and the effect, it no longer seems to be at work because now we are seeing that the domestic demand is also fading. So industry bodies and the government must work in tandem to tap the shrinking opportunities better and help the exporters move across this river of uncertainty by feeling the pebbles along the way. So deep sea fish conservation must not go adrift. And the Supreme Court of India has given permission to fishermen using the per scene of fishing, which is a, a method of fishing, to fish beyond the territorial waters, which is up till the 12 nautical miles and within the exclusive economic zone, which extends up to 200 nautical miles of Tamil Nadu, but observing that certain restrictions would be imposed and... Apart from that, we see that uh, the court's interim order of January 2023, it, uh, it is against the banning of the person fishing by the Tamil Nadu government. So Tamil Nadu government banned this type of fishing technique in February 2022, but the court's order, it seems to be more concerned about regulating the fishing with administrative and transparency measures than about the conservation measures and obligations which are the coastal state owes in its exclusive economic zone under the United Nations Convention on the Law of Seas, which is unclosed. So, however, conservation measures as suggested in various regional conventions and the judgments of various tribunals, we see that that should have informed the order also and per scene it tends to overfish overfish so in this type of fishing we see that it tends to overfishing and unlike the traditional fishermen they're using their traditional fish gear thus endangering the livelihood of the traditional fisher so obviously if it tends to overfish it has a certain kind of impact on the livelihoods of other fishermen also and obviously impacting the biodiversity of the sea and talking about the conservation and the convention, so the top court, it should see guidance from the obligations arising from the multilateral and the regional conventions, which India is signatory to. And obviously, one of that is UNCLOS. And then we have exclusive economic zone norms. So that is there. And... Then the crux of the SBT is TAC and the distribution. SBT is basically the Southern Bluefin Tuna 1993 conservation regarding that. And TAC is the total allowable catch. 
So the crux of this conservation of southern bluefin tuna 1993 is its total allowable catch that has been mentioned in the exclusive economic zone article 61 clause 1 and 2 of unclause and that could have uh, like basically sourced by the top court to enable the recovery of the depleted fishing stocks. So we see that here the distribution of allocations among the parties to the SBT, which are very relevant from the angle of conservation of the general fishery. So a fixed limit has been imposed. And apart from that regulation of the fishing methods, so merely restricting the person to fish on two days, that is on Mondays and Thursdays has been allowed. That is not sufficient without regulating the fishing methods that are being used. So obviously when it comes to regulation of the entire thing of the entire process in order to ensure that there is no overfishing and the environment is not being impacted apart from the livelihood of the fishermen so you if you restrict this type of fishing method to only two days that is not going to ensure or that is not merely sufficient to regulate this thing so international legal efforts are gradually moving in the direction of abandoning the use of large scale pelagic nets so the international efforts are going ahead in this manner and the huge size of the porcine nets, which like basically these type of nets uh, have a huge size and that allows maximum catch for the porciners, in turn leaving behind insufficient catch for the traditional fishermen. So this is one concern regarding this type of fishing method and the 1989 Convention for the Prohibition of the Fishing with Long Drift Nets in the South Pacific goes as far as to restrict port access for the drift net fishing vessels also. And United Nations General Assembly passed resolutions 44 to 225 and it supported and strengthened this development calling for a moratoria on all the large-scale pelagic drift net fishing vessels in high seas. So international efforts are basically to Either you need to like drop this uh, pelagic drift net fishing vessels altogether or they have been regulated in sort of manner. So that is one thing that has been done at the international level and on being like non-selective fishing technology. So the court's final judgment needs to look into the non-selective fishing methods by perceivers resulting in the bycatch of the other marine living species. So uh, a party under Article 22 Clause B can take measures to protect the human, animal or the plant life providers it involves, which is conservation of the exhaustible natural resources of such measures are made effective in conjunction with the restrictions on the domestic production and consumption. And despite the best conservation measures and the regulation of the fishing methods adopted by the authorities, it will be a challenge in dealing with the limitless character of the seas, which renders a common resource such as fish available for the exploitation by all. And when we talk about the theory of tragedy of commons, which says that freedom in a commons brings room to all. So obviously, when you allow such type of fishing methods, so obviously that would lead to over exploitation of the exhaustible natural resources so that should convince all the fishermen especially the seniors of Tamil Nadu that they must cooperate in complying with the conservation measures that are imposed on them so this is uh, all about the fishing methods and different international conventions which India is also signatory to so and one we talked about one of the steps that has been taken by the global community apart from that we talk about the theory of tragedy of commons and how it the freedom that it gives to using the resources in the commons can lead to ruining all the people and their obviously interest also so here this article is focusing upon uh, again the Adani issue so the title is as you can see and understand that can investments be free of risk so this is under the backdrop that Adani has been alleged of stock 
manipulation and certain financial miscalculations also. So the investors in the Adani group of companies, now obviously there is some fear and we saw that how these stocks have been performing, how volatile they have been and how they have been in a free fall. So can your investments be free of risk or not is a question that is being discussed in this article. So the uh, basically the authors of this article they are a professor uh, of economics at the university of massachusetts and we have uh, anand srinivasan who is an investor and he is a personal finance advisor also so recently a three judge bench of the supreme court had put forth the idea of setting up an expert committee that could recommend ways to protect the common investors from the market events so this comes from the Supreme Court and the court's recommendation. It came soon after again, we like this uh, whole issue of the Adani group of companies and the research basically. Uh, and okay, so can investments be free of risk is the question here that is being discussed. And we have we've discussed the background, the authors that we have. So what is the fundamental nature of risk in the markets? And why do returns vary based on the risk? So why, for instance, does the return on a fixed deposit turn out to be lower than the return on the stocks? So economists they measure risk differently from the way investors measures the risk and economists they think volatility is a risk but volatility is not a risk and in fact volatility is an investor's friend and it is not to be worried about at all so here like it is strictly in the sense of talking in the context of being an economist and being an investor in the stock market so we'll not go into the details of this so basically, the author says that I don't think we need another committee with a judge sitting on it to tell us what to do. And the role of the Supreme Court is not to make laws, but enforce them. So had the court enforced the existing regulations, this sorry state of affairs wouldn't have come to place. So this is one view. So in this picture, you can have a look at the U.S. Air Force F-35A fighter jet. So it looks like a bird or is it a plane? So obviously it's a fighter jet of the U.S. Air Force, which is its newest fighters. And it is a multi-role F-35A Lightning the two, and F-35A Joint Strike Fighter. They have made their debuts at the Aero India 2023 air show in Bengaluru this year. Again, the government is going to sell wheat from its buffer stock to boost the local supplies. And this is, again, the second time the government is doing this because we are seeing that cereal inflation is at a very high level. So if supply would be increased, obviously, that would result into lowering of the prices of wheat in the market. So basically, this article is now talking about mapping the general Parvez Musharraf's legacy. And so we'll be looking into only the main things here. So Musharraf, he ruled Pakistan from 1999 till late November 2007. And for him, Jammu and Kashmir's incorporation into Pakistan was an unfinished agenda of India's partition. So this is also an opinion that was and it continues to be widely held in Pakistan. And we know that Jammu and Kashmir is a territory of dispute between India and Pakistan and he drew the substance of his power from his position as army chief and the moment he handed over the baton he became powerless obviously we know that the army chiefs are much more powerful in Pakistan and he like recently died so that's why this article is here in the newspaper so the Pakistan's army has always acted as a body corporate and once a chief leaves, his honor is sought to be protected to all extent possible, but he's expected to stop interfering the army's functioning or in the country's public affairs. 
and he spent the last six years of his life in exile abroad with a treasure and conviction over his head and he battled a fatal illness and only his body was brought back to Pakistan to be buried. So today in Pakistan, when incumbent army chiefs, they still hold the substance of power in their hands. The retired chiefs, they continue to cut sorry figures once they take off the uniform. So this is kind of a trend that has been witnessed in Pakistan. And talking about the Indian connect, so he was a muhajir, which is a term which refers to Muslim migrants from India. So after partition, he migrated to Pakistan and his parents, they moved to Pakistan from Delhi. So he also married a muhajir lady also. And being a muhajir, he had to make a mark in an army dominated by Punjabi. So he hid his affinity for his muhajir colleagues well. But those who were in his inner circle, they knew of his sympathies for some muhajir officers also. So these are some things about him. So Indian Air Force is going to uh, is going ahead with the acquisition of 114 fighter jets, and that is going to be part of the major procurement plan. And there are going to be the multi-role fighter jets, uh, and it is set to take off soon. And along with the three different indigenous fighter development programs, also, so it will result in a mega five hundred fighter aircraft acquisition process for the armed forces. So right now, the Indian Air Force is currently down to 31 fighter squadrons as against the sanction strength of 42, which is uh, set to dwindle further as the remaining three MIG-21 squadrons, they are phased out by 2025. So we'll also be having the fifth generation advanced medium combat aircraft in the near future. And yeah, so that's how basically, again, we are like getting new fighter jets so that our strength does not do windows so much. And yeah, that is there. So, so Prime Minister opens the Adi Mahotsav and he says world has a lot to learn from the tribes. And you can see in the picture, he's been interacting with the tribal representatives. So the festival is being held in New Delhi. And he inaugurated this Trifids Adi Mahotsav tribal festival in New Delhi and said that the coming together of the diverse tribal cultures of India at such an event was giving new heights to unity in diversity. Then, then into the mainstream, so the government is working to reach those who were thought to be unreachable and living in the remotest parts of the country. So for those who thought they were on the margins, this government is bringing them into the mainstream. So they are coming into the mainstream and villages that used to be connected with separatism and extremism, they are now connected with 4G. And the youth who used to get pulled into divisive efforts, they are now accessing the internet and becoming part of the mainstream. So this is the stream of Sabka Saad, Sabka Vikas, Sabka Vishwas and Sabka Prayas, which is reaching every citizen of the far-flung areas of the country. And this is the sound of the confluence of Adi and Adhunikta, which is modernity, on which the soaring edifice of this new India will stand. So Election Commission of India, the it wraps the political parties for campaign on Twitter during polling in 
Tripura. So election commission says that the tweets, they are violative of the election law as they were made during the 48 hour silence period. And the chief electoral officer issues notices to the state units for the two parties who were found to be indulged uh, in such tweets. So obviously this violates the election law and So the notice said that these tweets, they violate section 126 uh, of the Representation of People Act 1951, which prohibits display to the public any election matter by means of cinematograph, television or other similar apparatus in the polling area during the period of 48 hours ending with the hour fixed for the conclusion of the poll for any election in that polling area. So Supreme Court is non-committal on early hearing on the collegium system and the petition has been filed which has sought the revival of the National Judicial Appointments Commission which was struck down by Supreme Court in 2015. So this issue has been going on between the union government and the judiciary for a very long time and we have been discussing it. So with center unlikely to make any overtures, people of Ladakh brace for the long haul. So we are seeing people of Ladakh, they are protesting and we have discussed this topic in detail also. What are their demands, why it all started and how long it has been that they've been protesting, they've been raising their demands to the government. So Ladakh is undergoing a crisis. We do not have any democracy there. People are at the mercy of bureaucrats in the absence of the elected representatives. So since we know that Ladakh was created a union territory in 2019, so it was not like made a union territory with a legislature. So because of that, it is obviously being administered directly by the bureaucrats and by the union government. So people are basically saying that even the bureaucracy is not so cooperative and it is very hostile to work with them so Ladakh is strategically important obviously we have been like having Chinese incursions in the eastern Ladakh also so you have Pakistan on the one side and China on the other so it is a very strategically important area for us and the main personality that is associated with this whole issue is Sonam Wangchuk and he's an education reformer and he's a popular voice from Ladakh. So said that Ladakhis did not want industries there because obviously they're, they don't want their environment to be impacted. We are seeing that glaciers, they are melting fast. And according to a study by the Kashmir University, 17 glaciers in proximity to the highways, they have melted at an accelerated pace. So given this, they do not, definitely they want jobs, but not at the cost of their environment. So Union Home Ministry does away with a clause in the National Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization guidelines that said a patient should be less than 65 at the time of registration. So. In a major tweak to this or organ donation policy, the union government said that the clause that the people aged beyond 65 could not receive the caravan organ transplants that has been now removed. And the government has decided to do away with the ceiling. Now people beyond 65 in need of an organ donation, they will also be eligible to get one. So we have the National Organ and Tissue Transplant Organization guidelines as uh, basically this has been done away with because it was found violative of this right to life article which is there under article 21 of the Indian constitution and obviously this is a fundamental right. So now an individual of any age can register for an organ transplant. And this is a step under One Nation, One Policy for the organ donation and transplantation. And we are also introducing a chapter in the school curriculum regarding the organ donation awareness for the students also. So yeah, obviously right now there is like people are not so much aware about it. And when we understand 
this data so it is like telling us that transplants specifically the kidney transplants from the living donor they are at their maximum then from disease so majorly we are like having kidney transplants at the highest level followed by liver and then we have heart lung and pancreas so india accounts for 52 percent of the world's new leprosy patients so COVID-19 had its severe impact on the leprosy case detection services and with a renewed focus on tackling leprosy, a union health ministry has devised a strategic roadmap for achieving zero cases of this infection by 2030. So despite India being declared leprosy eliminated in 2005, the country still accounts for over half of the world's new leprosy patients. So this is concerning and we have the national strategic plan and the roadmap for leprosy for 2023 till 27 and leprosy it is a chronic bacterial infection which affects your skin nerves lungs and the eyes so india's foreign policy seeks more fairness and this comes from our external affairs minister so it seeks more fairness and justice. And he said that this was like adding that India was looking for partners to transform the world. So under this backdrop, we are looking for more fairness and justice and not just our own vested interest. So he says that what for me has changed in the foreign policy of India today is that foreign policy is beginning to reflect a lot of deep socio-economic concerns we have in India. And just like we are transforming the world within the country, we want to also transform the world outside. We know that it's not something any country can do alone. And yeah, so that's why we need such partners who can work together in this initiative. So 12 more cheetahs from South Africa, they are likely to reach India today. And the this is basically the first batch of 12 cheetahs from the South Africa. And this is uh, obviously, firstly, we uh, got eight of these big cats from Namibia in the September. And the cheetahs, five of them are female. They have taken off from Johannesburg abroad as the Indian Air Force Boeing C-17 Globemaster aircraft. So they'll be reaching Gwalior on Friday and will then be taken to the Kuno National Park, which is there in Madhya Pradesh. Coming to the world news. So U.S. says that Bangladesh sanctions, they will remain until the police reforms and U.S. will not lift the sanctions on an elite Bangladesh police unit accused of extrajudicial killings until it is reformed. Russia's monstrous bureaucracy is impending Ukraine war and this is comes from the Wagner chief. So we are seeing that uh, the war has been turned much more offensive and specifically important right now is the Bamukth region of Ukraine. So Bamukth would have been taken before the new year if not for our monstrous military bureaucracy and the spokes that are put in the wheels daily. So Kaif says that it shot down 16 missiles fired from planes and ships in the Black Sea. So again, I'm saying that the geography of this entire region becomes very, very important for our examination. So you need to properly understand, you need to understand which all countries are bordering Ukraine and Russia and also about the Caspian Sea and the Black Sea, which is there. So government is likely to place the reverse charging of GST on scrap before the GST council. So basically there are certain reforms which we're expecting that should be taken up.
So the current GST regime, it causes significant disruption in the supply of the main raw material, metal scrap, thus making this a business continuity issue rather than a mere tax issue. So under this backdrop, they are like planning uh, for going ahead with the reverse charging of the GST on the scrap. So we saw that fuel demand, it saw the sharpest rebound in February. So the demand is increasing. So obviously we can see that businesses, they are now uh, again, they're getting back to the normal situation. And government, it slashes the levy on the crude oil, aviation turbine fuel and diesel. So this would bring down the prices also. And obviously we are seeing that inflation has been increasing. So this is kind of a relief for the consumers and the common people. So data usage per user, it rose to 19.5 GB in 2022 as per Nokia. So we are seeing that mobile penetration and the data penetration has been increasing. And garment exports, they shrank 3.5% in January as per the data. So we have been seeing that our exports are like not performing so well. So in the Financial Express, let's take up the important things that we have. So government is focusing on formalizing the economy and there is no plan to issue dollar denominated government securities as of now so the priority is keep the is to keep the growth momentum as it is and also to make sure that the further support measures for sustaining growth are provided and be conscious of the fact that challenges which are extraneous to india so obviously we need to be like keep monitoring all these things if there are any external challenges to the indian economy and obviously how we'll be going about them So when it comes to formalizing the economy, so one of the ways is with the tax deducted at source being one of the ways of achieving the goal of formalizing. So this is here and TDS, it is not a new tax. So the government is doing a lot to promote the industry, but we are also wanting to formulate the economy. And obviously that would lead to increasing the tax base and improving the tax buoyancy and improving the tax to GDP ratio. So that is going to be there when we talk about formalizing the economy and obviously jobs would be formalized and they would be having kind of social security also. And yeah, like there would be the, the interest of the employees would be taken into consideration. So windfall taxes, basically, these are the taxes which are imposed on the windfall profits of the companies and majorly they are imposed on the oil companies or the companies who are like indulged into exporting the ATFs and the diesel. So and uh, like when are these windfall taxes imposed is when there is a like sudden increase in the profits of such companies because of an external event and not because of any business decision. So it is then that these windfall taxes are imposed. So these has been like cut by the government. So when we talk about green energy transition, so the renewable firms, they may be blacklisted for the late projects and penalty for missing the deadlines, because obviously if the deadlines are missed, so it leads to cost overruns also. So to in order to avoid that, basically penalties would be imposed if the companies, they miss their deadlines. So renewable power firms, they may be excluded from the government contracts for failure to complete projects on time. And the move is in accordance with the government's general financial rules. So the restrictions will be for a period of three to five years. So China lifts the curbs on the seafood imports from India. And we have been seeing that Chinese economy is like opened up. So 
things are coming back to normal there. So here, what is important for us to know more about is from uh, the Marine uh, Products Export Development Authority. So you can find out more about it. And China had like suspended the imports of marine products from 110 units since December 2020 and ban on imports for the 99 units. It was lifted uh, on Tuesday. So that is kind of a relief. And we have been having the Adi Mahatsav. So yesterday also we looked into it. So our finance ministry says that staying is a step ahead. So the changes abroad, they are all going to be a challenge for the Indian exporters. So Indian exporters, they will have to be far more receptive of what is happening there or even foresee how that will pan out for them and keep constantly engaging with the government also in order to obviously overcome the challenges when it comes to exporting. So the budget 2020 for the financial year 2024, its provisions regarding taxing the winnings in the online games that is going to impose a like large cost on the gaming companies in the form of heavy and complex compliance burden. So the mechanism in place now will need a revamp to accommodate the amended provisions. And it is also pertinent to assess how the users will react to the proposed amendments especially the scrapping of the withholding tax threshold on winnings. So here the article is talking about what are the challenges ahead and what were the proposals in this year's budget for the gaming industries. So the uh, basically as per the IT Act, the gaming companies, they shall have to deduct taxes at the rate of 30% from the net winnings to the players at the end of the financial year. And for lotteries, crossword puzzles, games, etc., the threshold limit of rupees 10,000 for the tax deductible at source that shall continue, but sub it shall apply to aggregate winnings during a financial year. So the services boost to trade while we see that merchandise trade deficit that has narrowed down. However, the exports are falling, but it led to a sharp fall in the imports with services trade surplus has increased. So here it is important for us to know that we are having a trade surplus in our services sector and the exports they were likely supported by higher software services, professional and management consulting. And however, given the global slowdown and the looming recession, the strong services export growth could be at some risk of moderation. So this could even slow down uh, the basically the earnings from the services exports. It is expected that it might moderate coming ahead. And services trade surplus inching up, you can understand it, how it has been performing through this graph. So that has been increasing and merchandise trade deficit, it is like narrowing down. So it is declining and you can have a look at the trend also. So the coal and the oil imports, they are expected to surge. And here we have the estimations also. This is for the coal and here it is for the oil. So banks have been resorting to the multi-dimensional approach. So the loan demand, it pushes the banks to go all out for raising their deposits. So obviously we are seeing that loan demand has been increasing. So obviously it is important to uh, know that uh, whenever a bank is giving a loan, so obviously that is coming from the demand deposits that is ha that it has. And if the deposits are not going to increase, so obviously that is going to impact its capacity of lending the loans. So 
lenders will utilize partnerships and enhance the digital challenge channels and apart from that so with the deposit growth it is lagging the growth in the credit for quite some time now so banks they are taking a multi-dimensional approach to source these deposits in order to cater to the strong demand for the loans in the economy so in addition to hiking the interest rate on the deposits lenders will look to reach out to new customers through the partnerships and enhance their digital challenge so if the interest rate are increased obviously that is going to attract more of savers so people would be depositing more into the bank accounts because now they would be getting a higher interest rate on their savings and this graph is showing the credit to deposit gap so this gap has been increasing so that is a concern for the banking sector So in January, we saw that gold imports, they fall 76% to a 32-month low. And that was obviously because of low domestic demand. And that was majorly because the domestic prices, they rallied to record highs and jewelries. The jewelers, they postponed their purchases, hoping for a cut in the import duty by the government and lower imports by the world's second biggest bullion consumer. It could weigh on the benchmark gold prices. So India is the second largest gold consumer globally and it is like the demand the domestic demand was low, less because the gold prices were at a uh, upper end. So China's oil buying is a boost for the global demand outlook. So if the Chinese economy is going to expand and if it is demanding more of oil, so we feel that it is going to like, uh, like economically expand and the businesses are also going to perform nicely. So that is kind of uh, like we are having a confidence and a positive expectations regarding the global growth. So in the Financial Express, let's see what important things do we have here. So the things that we've already discussed, we are not going to take them up again. so here we have the political news will directly go to the okay so we are seeing that further inflation is rising and there is no likely dip in the milk prices also we have been talking about increase in cereal inflation also so government is like uh, selling the buffer stock in the open market through e-auction so that the prices come down and inflation is a concern for us and legal system should move away from the old, old boys club. This is coming from the Chief Justice of India. So he says that the Indian arbitration space should have diversity in source and in experience and if the Indian legal system has to move away from the tag of being an old boys club, the arbitration space can add heft to the mission to provide equal opportunity to men, women and them. And he spoke of the role that courts play in ensuring an effective arbitration ecosystem where they can step in to protect the independence as well as impartiality of the proceedings. So coming to the explained page. So what are the factors behind moderating current account deficit and how it will impact the markets? So let's understand this thing. So recently the data was released by the government and it shows that India's exports and imports, they have declined. And 
that is for the month of January. So there are indications that the current account deficit, that is the difference between the exports and the imports that will moderate despite the global slowdown triggered by the rising inflation and the rising interest rates. So the moderation in the current account deficit that is expected to be aided by the fall in the commodity prices, rising workers' remittances, and the services exports and abatement of the selling pressure by the foreign investors, it is said to boost the sentiment on the investment front by taking the pressure off the currency. So what is the significance of current account deficit? So when the value of the goods and services that a country the, it, it imports that exceeds the value of the products that it is exporting. So it is called the current account deficit. So that's how we calculate it. It is a very simple thing. And current account deficit and the fiscal deficit, they together make up the twin deficit. So whenever we talk about twin deficits, we are talking about the current account deficit and the fiscal deficit. So these are the enemies of the stock market and the investors. And when both of these things are increasing so obviously people would not like to invest much into india and if the current uh, uh, if the current account that is the country is trade and the transactions with the other countries it shows surplus that indicates that money is flowing into the country and that boosts the foreign exchange reserves and the value of rupee against the dollar so basically rupee appreciates and these are the factors that will have ramifications on the economy and the stock markets as well as on the returns on the investments by the people so this is all about here it is important thing and then we discussed this so how the trade deficit it narrows in january so basically it narrowed because the imports also fell however exports were also falling but imports also fell so that's how it is uh, it helped in narrowing down the current account deficit and are the capital flows going to improve or not? So while there is a perception in the markets that capital flows, they could come under some pressure with China's reopening and any deviations in the monetary policy expectations. So when we are talking about the foreign capital, so right now we are seeing that it is moving out of the Indian economy because firstly, the Chinese uh, markets, they have reopened and obviously uh, globally, the policy rates, they have been increase so that is basically for the foreign investors they feel that if the interest rates are increasing in their own countries or in any any other country which they feel is much more safer from the context of the investment so they are basically withdrawing out of india so that is adding up to the pressure on the indian rupee and that is the current situation Apart from that, at a time when the economies of many developed countries, they are expected to take a hit. The RBI has projected the GDP growth for the next fiscal at 6.4%. And the union budget has indicated a capital expenditure of around rupees 10 lakh crores. So moreover, with the rise in the interest rates in India after the RBI hiked the repo rate by 250 basis points. So repo rate right now, it is at 6.5%. So the non-resident Indian deposits, remittances, and the FPI investment in debt, they are expected to rise further. So we are expecting more of capital inflows into the Indian economy. So capital flow into India, it came under pressure in 2022 amid the interest rate rise in the USA. So this we have discussed and whenever, like whenever there is an increase in the policy rate in the USA, so we see that uh, the foreign investors, they withdraw from the Indian markets. So FPIs, they pulled out around rupees 1 lakh 21,000 crores in 2022 with uh, in the first six weeks of 2023, the FPIs, they flow, the FPI flow, it has been negative. So even in like January, the FPIs, they have been exiting the Indian market. So how will this impact the market? So with raising the current account deficit, it raises concerns among the investors at, as it hurts the currency. So thereby the inflow of the funds into the market mm -hmm. is also uh, like hurt and a notable decline in the current account deficit in January that has improved the market sentiments. So experts say that current account deficit is very important for the currency and the value of an economy hinges a lot on the value of its currency and thereby it also supports the equity markets by keeping the fund flow intact. So while the numbers for January, they have come good, experts say there's this, that this needs to be now sustained and reduction in the current account deficit, it is, a, we can say, a positive factor which can attract more of foreign uh, foreign. Uh, FPI investment, that is foreign portfolio investments into the Indian economy.
So talking about one year of the war in Ukraine, so this war completes one year. So what does a long drawn war it mean for Russia and the West? And why have there not been more peace efforts regarding this war? And what was the recent meeting between NSA uh, Ajit Doval and the Putin about? So the war of attrition, the expectation that the Russian president he might have had of a quick operation in Ukraine that would perhaps end with a regime change in Kai was bellied as Ukraine under the president uh, Zensky, he fought back. So this was not expected that Ukraine is going to sustain for such a long time period in this war. So that is one thing. And Ukraine said that it intercepted 16 of these missiles recently. So the US led Western alliance, including Germany. It was reluctant at first to break out of its pacifist mold and reconsider its economic dependence on Russia. Quickly, it all of them like came together, the NATO countries and Germany. So these countries, they have poured billions of dollars worth of armaments into Ukraine over the last year. So these countries, they have been supporting Ukraine and providing the armaments and the financial aid. So recently, Germany and US, they have promised to send tanks to assist the Ukraine's war efforts. And USA has supplied the Patriot missile systems. UK has also sent the missiles and tanks. Turkey uh, chipped in with the Barat, the Baratrik attack drone. And Australia, Canada, and USA, they gave the uh, M777 missiles. So like different uh, artillery has been provided by different countries specifically from the West. So the war, it has transformed the transatlantic partnership with Europe accepting the America's leadership of the alliance. And it has also strengthened NATO. So this is one impact that we can see. So with the promise of the tanks and a consideration of the Ukraine's request for F-16s, Russia sees this, uh, this as nothing but a proxy war being fought by the Ukraine on behalf of the US and West. So for Russia, this is an existential war. So Russia feel that it is a kind of a proxy war also going on because the Western countries, the NATO countries, they are supporting Ukraine. So basically they are saying that Ukraine is fighting war on behalf of these countries. So this is called proxy war. And there have been like no major peace efforts that have been taken so that this war comes to an end. And talking about India and the war, so Delhi, which has maintained a barely like nuanced balance between not condemning Russia outright for the invasion and maintaining important relationships with the US and Europe that has like patted itself on the back for displaying strategic autonomy at this consequential moment in the world geopolitics. So India is like, it is not a kind of criticizing Russia completely. And at the same time, we are also maintaining good relations with US, Europe, and other Western world countries. So, but the difficulties of retaining this balance, they are becoming now evident. So, on the one hand, the pressure from the US to get off the fence have grown over the past year, despite all the public expressions of understanding for the position of a partner whose role is crucial to Washington in the contain China project. And on the other hand, Delhi is facing up to the inevitable economic decline of Russia. So India needs Russia to remain an autonomous power in the Eurasian landscape, one that will not uh, accept the Chinese geopolitical hegemony and an economically collapsed Russia as a Chinese satellite is the last thing Delhi would want. So a recent visit by our national security advisor to Moscow for a conference of the regional NSAs during which he met Vladimir Putin, that has triggered the speculation that he uh, may have been carrying a message from the prime minister. So Putin is not known to me, the foreign dignitaries, other than his counterparts. And at this point, what Delhi would want most, and the prime minister has already articulated this to Putin through his soft quoted remark is, this is not the era of war and is for this war to end basically that is what we want so we want this war to end as soon as possible so in the year of its g20 presidency india has also indicated a willingness to make peace in europe and give a voice to the global south that wants this war to end quickly so did Duval convey to put in that it is time to find a way out of this dead end quickly though the proceedings of their meetings they have remained under wraps and the two would not have met only to exchange the entries or to discuss the weather so that is there and so this is basically about the Sri Lankan civil war and the main personality in that was Prabhakaran 
so it is about how he was killed and talking about the final days of this sri lankan civil war so the beginning when we talk about the beginning so the may like when we talk about the major stakeholders in this war it was the liberation liberation tigers of tamil elam and prabhakaran was basically was heading it so he was basically the leader of it so his death was announced uh, on 18th may 2009 as a three decade sri lankan civil war it ended in an orgy of violence in the rebel held territories in the north and the east of the island and basically you can read this article it is not of that much importance for us so here it is about the death of prabhakaran and last stand and the beginning of the end so we can talk about uh, the end of the civil war so the sri lankan government in 2002 and the ltte it entered into a ceasefire which was brokered by norway so however uh, however by 2006 the truce it was dead with each side accusing the other of not sticking to the terms of the ceasefire so while the ltte it care it carried out repeated guerrilla attacks so basically they were using the guerrilla warfare and suicide missions so sri lankan army it pushed deeper into the rebels eastern territories and then to the north so north is known as japna and in 2008 the government of the president mahinda rajapaksha formally announced the annulment of the ceasefire agreement after a bus carrying the government soldiers to a military hospital in colombo it was targeted uh, in a mine attack so over the following years the sri lankan forces they pushed northwards and finally they capturing this region and the de facto administrative capital of the uh, ltte and except for the limited counter attacks in jaffna the ltte it was not able to mount a counter of uh, counter offensive so prabhakaran is believed to have told his intelligence chief at the time that 75% of the ltte's strength had gone downstream and they would have to hold on till the international community could stop this war so plan to reinforce infrastructure on the line of actual control is welcome it needs to be part of a broader defense strategy to check beijing's incursion specifically in arunachal pradesh we have the doklam standoff and also in eastern uh, ladakh so the government decision to allocate a substantial sum of money to improve the facilities in places along the line of actual control it has come none too soon so we are also having a vibrant villages program that is going to boost tourism and the infrastructure in the border villages so that is there and apart from that we are building upon the infrastructure so new battalions of indo tibetan border police would also be stationed along the border with china in arunachal pradesh and on both the sides the idea is to build permanent population settlements along the border to cement each side's claim to the territory under its control along the disputed sections of the line of actual control and the uh, attempted chinese incursion in tawang in arunachal pradesh last december it seems to have brought home the clear and present danger along the road so the attempted chinese incursion in the wang in arunachal pradesh it was like it showed that there is brought home clear message that there is danger along the line of actual control and building the vibrant villages and developing infrastructure on the border they are important so the fast moving consumer goods firms they expect and they hope that the rural recovery will lift their profits up so right now we were seeing that even the rural demand has been declining 
So that impacts the FMCG firms. So that's all for today. Thank you for joining and Sarkar. You will be getting the PDF link in the description box. And do not forget to subscribe to the channel, hit the like button and share this video as much as possible.